This time I'm looking at Nintendo Power number 64 for September of 1994, with several high-profile sequels this issue. There is a lot of good stuff to cover this issue, so let's get started. Our cover game this time could get more high-profile, but it's hard to get higher profile than this with a third-party game. Mortal Kombat 2. The cover also makes it clear that we are definitely now getting into the mid-90s with this very harsh visual aesthetic. The main focus of the letters column for this issue is what the winner of the Baja 500 contest got. And the answer is they got one hell of an experience. They got to see Ivan Stewart win his seventh Baja 500, starting from last place. Um, not just, like, seeing the starting line point, but also flying along in a helicopter and seeing the route along the way and listening to the uh, navigation radio and all that other fun stuff. That's honestly pretty cool. We start off with our cover game, with information on babalities and friendship moves, but what's even more important than that are the full move lists, with fatalities, the babalities, and friendships for each of the new characters, along with notes on how to fight Noob Cybot, Jade, and Smoke. They're definitely getting all in on the idea that this game is the full Mortal Kombat 2 experience. Mortal Kombat 2 feels a lot more like a solid port of the arcade version than the SNES version of the first game. It helps that MK2 has all the blood and gore as the original game, as helped by the AI being perfectly willing to use fatalities on you, both as a way of showcasing the moves as well as the rub in the face of the player how unforgiving the AI can be. Really, I'd say that MK2 is definitely much more worth picking up than MK1, this is Super Nintendo. If you can find copies of both at a used game store somewhere, and you only getting one, get Mortal Kombat 2. Next up is Super Bom Bomberman 2, with a basic rundown of the power-ups and multiplayer modes, along with notes on several levels. Super Bomberman 2, like the first title, is a fun, engaging, and incredibly addictive action puzzle game with a spectacular multiplayer mode attached to it. To both the game's credit and detriment, the game this game doesn't ramp up the difficulty from the get-go, assuming that you played the earlier games of the series. This means that Super Bomberman 2 works just as well as a jumping on point as the first game did, and does provide a bit of a refresher course for returning players. However, if you blew through the first title, this also means that the earlier stages of this game are going to feel rote. Thus, in brief, it's worth getting, but there isn't the same name need to buy this game and the game before it. It is both new Bomberman and the same Bomberman. If you don't have any Bomberman games, fine. If you played the hell out of the first game and just want some different single-player puzzles, you'll also be fine. If you only play Bomberman for the multiplayer and you already own a different game in the series and you're not out to get a complete set, there isn't necessarily a reason to get this one. We have our first article on Killer Instinct, billed as our first look at the Ultra 64. We get some images of the characters and quite a few images of gameplay in particular and discussion of that. Our third sequel of the issue is Pocky and Rocky 2, which has all bunch of new supporting characters. Further, while the first game's US release appeared to have bizarrely downplayed some of the Japanese elements of the localization, this release has embraced it at least more. The article has maps of levels 2 through 4, along with 6, and notes on levels 5, 7, and 8. Presumably, those levels are more linear. Pocky and Rocky 2, the first time, is a game that feels like would almost work better as a twin-stick shooter, with the way enemies move in from all directions, and using a second stick to aim and fire feels like it would allow the player to better dodge enemy attacks while moving and shooting. Either that, or having the left shoulder button block the direction you shoot, so you can fire in the direction where the enemies are coming from by, while also dodging them, or by dodging attacks from bosses while continuing to fire in the direction of their... Existence. Still, it is an incredibly good game, and I really wish we saw more shooters like this. Hell, I'm especially surprised we haven't seen any Toho fan games modeled after Pocky and Rocky. As of this issue's publication date, we're coming up on football season, and we're still in baseball season, so we have a football game and a baseball game this year. The listed games are Super Soccer Champ 2, which was a US port of the Japanese game Hat Trick Hero 2. 
And while there are ROMs of the Japanese version, there aren't any leaked ROMs of the US release. Ninja Power was able to cover it, which means there's a prototype out there, which means it's time for my monthly reminder for you to check out the Video Game History Foundation, because if you have a prototype of this game, then you should shoot them a line, because... That belongs in a museum! Additionally, we have Troy Aikman NFL Football, Tecmo Super Baseball, ESPN Sp Speed World on here as well. So those are three we'll be covering. First up, Troy Aikman NFL Football. This feels like a good football game, in the sense that if you look at the footage, I'm playing it poorly, but I also feel like if I just sat down with the manual and played the game for a while, just popped on some podcasts and played it and gave it time, I could probably do better at the game if I just had enough time to just learn it over a per significant period of time. I also appreciate that some of the features that I couldn't really dive into are there, but I'm impressed the game includes, like, the ability to, exe to edit existing plays. That said, I also feel that that is a feature that could work better on consoles with memory cards, where you could put together a killer playbook and bring it over to your friend's house. In fact, this is a feature that later games, like NFL Blitz, did include on home consoles. Like Roger Clemens MF MVP Baseball, Tecmo Super Baseball really utilizes Mode 7 in the presentation of the game by moving the camera perspective closer to the player's level and point of view, instead of trying to replicate the more distant camera perspectives used by TV broadcasts, and it generally works. This is helped by a few gameplay innovations that would be definitely adopted by later, other titles later, like putting highlights on the level where pop flies are going to land, and using that to approximate the ability of a player to read the arc of a ball and judge where to, they need to be so they can get under it. That said, there are problems with how this perspective is ultimately up executed, particularly when it comes to backing up catch a pop flying. If the ball is going to land in front of you, you're fine. But if the landing point is behind you, not so much. The thing is, I played a little bit of Little League back in the day, I know that if a ball is going to land behind you, you can look up and kind of judge, okay, I'm in front of it, I need to back up. And approximately which direction. You're not as good at judging the position necessarily that's in front of you, but it still is approximately the same. As far as fielding goes, the AI is at the same level as the player. Where they're better at is hitting. They're really, really good at putting the fall ball in between fielders, so it's hard to catch a pop fly. Now, part of this is the point of being better at batting. A good batter, if you look at them and say, either with a batting machine or even with another with an actual human pitcher, and then you give them some targets, they'll you'll see them aiming for those targets based on what on the bat and various other factors. And so, presumably, with some practice in the game, I can obtain some more accuracy. It's just a question of the play time to get that accuracy. ESPN Speed World tries to strike a good balance between a realistic racing game and an arcade-style racing game. The controls are simple and easy to use, cornering is generally pretty straightforward, and from a driving standpoint, it's a game that's easy to pick up and play. And then you add tire management to the equation. Like in the first race, I couldn't complete the race because my tires wore out and apparently didn't have any spares, or I didn't hit the button to get my spares changed. That should be a setting that you will opt into, not something that's on by default on normal. I don't have a problem with having the pit to fuel up. I don't have a problem having a pit, having the pit to have my tires changed. But if you're going to be track these things, to let the game do the changes without my input, and if you need my input, then make it clear and easy to tell in game what button I need to press to make that change. To wrap up the sports coverage, we've got our sport, fall sports preview. A sneak to title in the coverage here is Mountain Bike Challenge, which supports the life cycle. If you haven't heard about this, ReRes has a really good video on the game and the device. Links will be in the show notes. Moving on, the next game is Blackthorn, developed by Blizzard and published by Interplay, with some very 90s comic book art. It appears to be something of a cinematic action platformer like Prince of Persia and Out of This World, the article includes level maps for the mine and the tree areas of the game. Blackthorn kind of plays both 
as well as Out of This World, and not quite as well. The movements of the characters are just as fluid when it comes to walking around and jumping, but in other respects it's a lot more finicky. I ran into a bunch of problems where I tried to press up to get in the cover to avoid getting shot, only for my character to step up, take a step back to a previous screen in order to do it, or where the animation to duck out of cover and fire a gun was just a little bit too long and I ended up getting a cheap hit. I'm really interested in seeing how the PC version compares to this, so this is a situation where there are problems with the specific port, or if something else was going on that's intrinsic to how the game was designed in general. Returning to sequels, we've got a sequel to Koei's business strategy game Aerobiz, with in-depth notes on gameplay. Aerobiz Supersonic is a simulator game that is quite possibly even deeper and more intricate than the first game was. In preparation for this review, I just sat down and read a fact on the game, in addition to playing it, and discovered a whole bunch of new elements about how the game is balanced that I wasn't familiar with, from how the AI behavior changed between difficulty levels, with the AI actually playing more dip aggressively on lower difficulties, so in theory they'd be easier to beat, except they also can cause them to possibly kick your butt if you don't know they're doing that, for example. It's all the mechanical complexity of Romance of the Three Kingdoms and the Nobunaga's Ambition games, but with none of the combat, which, depending on your taste, will be either a big plus or a big minus. As far as personal remembrance of this game go, uh, I played the heck out of this game, me and my peers, in high school, because this was an emulator ROM that they let us play basically in school, in class, not in class, but in the computer labs and stuff, without too much repercussions, because it's actually somewhat education degree. We have another super effects game this issue with Vortex from Argonaut Entertainment who developed Star Fox and designed the chip. This appears to be a mech combat game with transforming robots. The article also continues with the 90s comic book art. Vortex is an interesting game. It's very different from Star Fox, through how the gameplay interface works, and through having a transforming robot instead of just a spaceship. Though considering what they had in mind for Star Fox 2, and ended up implementing in Star Fox 64, this feels like this was something of a dry run for some of the game mechanics that ended up being implemented in the Star Fox sequels. Particularly considering that these mechanics were implemented in a much simpler fashion in the later games. Vortex ends up reflecting this by having your weapon lineups and controls being a little clunky. Targeting with the machine gun is rough, as you have no real targeting reticle for that gun. But you do get lock-on indicators for the missiles, missiles, making those generally a better choice of weapon, except for occasions where you're forced to use the machine gun, like with the robot's fighter form. That said, Vortex is shockingly affordable on eBay, with copies, when I last searched, being available for around 10-15 bucks. Loose, of course. Sheehan's Revenge brings us our last piece of 90s comic book art for the issue, with an on-rails arcade game that probably used the light gun back in the arcade, but uses the controller or mouse in the console, which actually might help it age better. The internal art for this article is more manga-influenced, which I appreciate. Sheehan's Revenge feels like a very brutal arcade port. The enemy attacks you with enemies on three different planes, short, medium, and long ranges, with you being able to attack opponents in the back two ranges with your ranged attack, while being limited to using a melee slash done by moving the controller or the mouse against close enemies. That slash can also counter projectiles. Unfortunately, while the guide in the article says you can use the mouse to play the game, I'm using an emulator for doing the video capture here, and and, well, it didn't appear to work in my emulator with the mouse enabled. Though other coverage I found of the game also shows that the game has mouse support, so presumably I could find the feature with more time. However, in my case, I was stuck with the controller, and oof, that is not the way to play this game. For this game to work well, you have to be both precise and fast. You can aim precisely with a light gun, but you can't slash. You can do one or the other with the controller, but you can't really do both. Really, this is a game that would actually work better now, or at least a couple console generations ago, with the Wii or the PlayStation Move, with motion controls. Or, for that matter, with the Switch and the Joy-Cons. I am legitimately shocked this game was not remade for either of those systems, as the game mechanics would have been perfect for those. 
Returning to the various games that Rare is developing for Nintendo, there's an article in the making of Donkey Kong Country, and in particular, bringing up the game that the game uses 3D rendered characters to make digitized sprites, as opposed to using filmed actors, like in Mortal Kombat, or rotoscoped characters, like with Prince of Persia, or Out of This World. This issue also had the conclusion of the Secret of Mana walkthrough. Now, in classified information, this issue has a 20 continue code for Tasmania. And continuing with the codes of advice in Counselor's Corner, this issue has several questions about Link's Awakening, which are answered here. Moving into Game Boy titles, first off is the Game Boy version of Tasmania, which combines platformer levels with behind the back action levels with the same sort of pole position camera angle that the Super Nintendo version had. Let's enumerate the sins of the platformer levels of this game for a minute. This is a game where you're playing as the Tasmanian Devil, the peak of his popularity as a Looney Tunes character, a character known for spinning and plowing through everything in his path like a living buzzsaw. Indeed, that sound effect was specifically used to indicate Plaz Taz was going through something. However, in this game, in its platforming stages, you are given a limited number of spins, which appear not to be something you can replenish. And this is your only attack verb. As while jumping on enemies will not hurt you, but it will not kill the enemies. The only way to remove opponents from the level is to hit them with a spin. Further, once you start spinning, you cannot stop spinning until your spin finishes its cycle. And you lose the accuracy of your jump during this time. So you have to be very, very careful when you start spinning, not only so you can maximize your effectiveness of your attack, but also so you don't end up killing yourself. In other words, the developers of this game managed to screw up, at the fundamental level, the very act of playing as the main character, of playing as the Tasmanian Devil, in every possible respect. And the cherry on top of this shit Sunday is that this game has limited discontinues. To hell with this game. Our final title of the issue is the Game Boy Mighty Morphin Power Rangers game, which is something for Brawler. There are some general gameplay notes, but with no major tips. The game basically gets the bare minimum, which isn't a vote of confidence. Yeah, so Mighty Morphin Power Rangers for the Game Boy basically plays like a really crappy version of ER of um, Kung Fu slash Spartan X. Um, I honestly can't say if the ROM I used for capturing gameplay footage here is the root cause of the video stutter and the slow movement that I have here, and the sluggish turnaround and that sort of thing, or if the game itself just is truly that bad. But... I'm moving super sluggishly in this game. Uh, I can't turn around fast enough to land quick attacks and enemies come from behind as opposed to Kung Fu, where you can just do it in an instant. Um, like, this concept of not like a scrolling, um, uh, horizontal scrolling uh, beat em up band beat him up like with, um, not like Double Dragon, but more like Game of Kung Fu. Not like it's a, inherently a bad concept, in fact, indeed, for something like, well, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, it can certainly work, particularly on the Game Boy, where you have limited screen real estate, so just doing this sort of, this approach to the game works just fine, or could work just fine, but the execution here is just so dire that it makes the game unplayable. Now, again, if this ROM dump is the problem, and that if you had a, a good, clean cartridge that they got this from, or, for that matter, if I was doing this capturing myself off uh, from an original cartridge, and the issue was on the cartridge there, if the issue was with that, then I could see, okay, maybe playing with a original cartridge would be fine, but I don't have ac access to that if that's the circumstance. So, but what I've got, this game is terrible, it's unplayable, and you shouldn't play it. In the top 20 column on the Super Nintendo chart, Super Metroid has the number one spot with the two other sport or two other sports titles, NBA Jam and Ken Griffey Jr. Baseball, taking the other two spots. 
but don't actually even see the big two fighting games until the bottom five of the top ten. In the now playing column, the also rides include a Nobunaga's Ambition sequel for the Super Nintendo, Lords of Darkness, which appears to be leaning into Nobunaga's reputation, and a console port of Math Blasters, and also a wrestling game, Hammerlock Wrestling. Finally, in Packwatch, we have more high-profile games on the way. Final Fantasy III, Adventures of Batman and Robin, based on Batman the Animated Series, The Lion King, Sparkster, and Uncharted Waters, New Horizons. My pick of the issue is straight up Mortal Kombat 2. Vortex was definitely interesting. One of those titles would have completely overlooked if I hadn't been doing this show. Hockey and Rocky is, uh, 2 is also good, but it, it, it's, in, it's interesting and it's certainly fun. The problem I have with it is related to how the shooting works. It's, it's a game which needs either twin, twin sticks... Or locking your, or an ability to lock your fire in a particular direction, or something like that. Um, Mortal Kombat 2 is a very clear, perfect, well, as close to as arcade perfect you can get by the time, port of game, while adding enough softening of the rough edges to work for a home console room. You can use that sort of thing. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe, and also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any f future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.